Okay, good. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum to all the students. Most of you are here. Yes. Hi everyone. Do you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's good. We're going to have a so our second class today, uh, looking at the, the chapter on the requirements engineering processes, context and boundaries. Yeah, we're going to study a few what what are the main the core activities. Yeah, for this uh, what we refer as the requirements engineering process. Okay, so uh, yeah, we're going to co to cover these things. If we have time, then we can go through a video. Yeah, just try to share with you the insights of the requirements engineering. Yeah, I'm sure uh, you can hear me. Yeah, all of you. Okay. Okay. So when we talk about uh, requirements engineering process, most of you are here. I'm on time. Yeah, Zamil, are you here? You can hear me well, Zamil. Okay. Can you hear me, Zamil? Very well? Yes. All right. Okay, good. Okay, I know there's a lot of you here over here, so hopefully you can uh, listen to me even though uh, there's about, you know, uh, I mean the late evening, yeah, from 4 to 5 and 6. Hopefully we can try to make it uh, smooth and easy today, yeah. So, uh, like I mentioned to you, the objective of this lecture is to look at what we refer as the requirements engineering processes. Yeah. So, what are the elements inside that? What are the contexts? What are the boundaries that, that we need to know yeah? in order to perform this process? So, if you notice that uh, many, many, uh, you know, activities, yeah, or you've been studying software engineering for a few years already, I'm sure. Uh, you notice that there's a lot of models that we develop, right? So why did we develop model in software engineering? Yeah, most of you might think that, you know, that is the way to represent. Yeah, we have a process model uh, to actually uh, see, uh, analyze the model yeah? in order to improve them. Yeah. So similarly, yeah, in this case, we going to look at the requirements engineering model. Yeah, because a requirements engineering model. Uh, is important, yeah. We mentioned the importance of having the proper requirements, the uh, accurate requirements, yeah, to be the basis, yeah, for the development of a correct, yeah, acceptable systems, yeah, sorry, systems. So today we're going to look at the details of that, hopefully, yeah. And we start with the very simple idea of what what we refer as a process model, yeah. We try to actually differentiate our e process model with the others yeah so when we just talk about the process most of you have in mind this input and output yeah so this is the very basic uh, representative of any process model they should have a set of input and then of course certain sets of activities to be performed and then a set of output yeah so of course you have uh, done this yeah i'm sure you for, for, for example some of you you can come in, right? Most of you, most of you. Why are you requesting to come? Okay. If. All right. Uh, sorry about that. Someone is asking me to, to come to the class. Okay. So we can just have, a, you know, a process can be considered anything yeah, that you have an input and a set of output yeah so the the simplest maybe the, some of the process that you might have come across yeah like you try to organize a seminar you try to organize a conference so that is considered a process yeah? and then you have to design a processor chip and then of course the software development uh, software development itself is actually a process yeah? that actually require a lot of knowledge and understanding so there can be a simple process in which you just follow some kind of a routine steps yeah? but there can be a lot of complex uh, process in which they require a lot of knowledge yeah? like we refer to the requirements engineering uh, process yeah, sorry. oh someone uh, someone uh, record for me thank you uh, if you record then please later on you please share eh, the one that record this uh, uh, this lecture can you later on share at the file yeah? 
when you already download the because I don't have the access to the recording because I'm not the one that share the lecture and that record the lecture yeah please thank you all right so the okay I'm talking about the process just now so there can be a complex process knowledge intensive process like the so development process or the requirements in the process or there can be just a simple process in which like we try to organize a seminar or maybe we can just try to write a letter so that is a simple process yeah all right so in our case uh, we are referring to a quite a very quite knowledge intensive uh, uh, process yeah in which we refer as the a requirements engineering process so if you want to just mention briefly before we go detail later we can say that these are actually the set of inputs that is needed yeah when we want to develop uh, we want to be an input to the re process yeah so we, at least we need some kind of uh, you know project plans project initiation uh, deliverables yeah? we have to have a vision yeah the vision is like the i mean it's like what are the changes that we want to make yeah uh, that we want to bring yeah, with the systems and then we have of course yeah, all these uh, requirements that we gather from the system context which include the stakeholder needs the existing software how information business technical processes physical technical events yeah as well as the documents yeah all the documentations that might have previously yeah before the starting of the our system yeah we we might for example have all the manual systems as all well in the form of documents so this can be the input yeah? and after going through the process hopefully we have come up with a better set of requirements yeah? usually in our case uh what we want yeah as a formal uh, as a what we call a concrete uh, requirement document what we refer as a system requirement specification yeah srs yeah? Um, this can be like a blueprint yeah or a contract that can be the basis for further development going through the input to the system design process later on yeah and also we need to take hold as the output from the re process include all the uh, you know the systems model, yeah, system solution models that, that we have come out, yeah. For example, all these uh, case, case diagrams, you know, use case diagrams, uh, activity diagrams, to support the SRS that we have developed, we have written, yeah. So that is about the RE process, yeah. Don't worry, we're going to have further discussion about the system context and so on. Okay, so when we said one of the main element, yeah, to be the input to the to the RE process, to the requirements engineering process, we have to have a vision. Yeah, uh, a vision is what we uh, what we actually have. Uh, I mean, what we refer as the change, the change that we want to bring with the development of the system that we want to develop. Yeah, and of course, the the vision can be very abstract. It just mentions what to what you what you need to achieve. Yeah, it doesn't explain. I mean, it doesn't need to actually explain how the process is going to be. Yeah? So you can have a lot of vision. For example, before the uh, starting or as the you know the input to the uh, I mean the our our system, yeah, the web systems for the student registration, yeah, the course registration systems. We have the vision that the system, the student can register the courses anywhere, anytime, yeah. So that is the vision, yeah. So we want it to be, you know, flexible that the, the students can assess the student registration systems anywhere, anytime, and I mean, you know, it, at any platform, yeah. So that's what we our our vision is, yeah. And we can have a simple vision, for example, a very specific vision, for example, to increase the level of security of an online banking, yeah. Yeah. Why they cannot join? Sorry, sorry. I have to check. I check here. It's sorry, seven two. Or oh, the one that doesn't apply to come to the team, is it? They they cannot enter, or they coming out from not the UM mail. Please use the the UM mail to come in. Actually, much easier for you to join. Huh? Okay, all right. You're asking me to. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so 
back to the lecture. I'm sorry about this. Okay, so I'm still talking about the vision, yeah? So that means before, uh, or one of the mo uh, most important element, yeah, as the input to the RE process is that you establish a vision, yeah, in the context. And then the vision can be as a guidance, lah, yeah? because later on the stakeholders going to give you a lot of inputs, yeah, about what they want and so on. So uh, the vision can be like the guiding, yeah, to align all the activities, yeah, with the defined vision. And of course, the vision itself is not sufficient because it just highlights to you what to achieve. Yeah? For example, you have heard about the vision of the uh, President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, in which they want to have, his vision is very high. For example, he wants to have a man, yeah? he wants to land a man on the moon. Yeah? So in order to do that, so that means we have to do a lot of things, yeah, a lot of uh, all these transportation systems, everything, yeah, in order to achieve the goal or the vision of having to land men on the moon, yeah. So the vision is very high at that time, yeah. And of course, they, they are able to do it, yeah. All right, so that is one thing. The input will be the vision. And another important thing as well that we should be aware of is that we should be able to understand the system context, yeah. The systems the, that we want that we want to develop doesn't exist in vacuum. Yeah, it exists in the context. Yeah, in the context in which it contains the requirement sources. It contains all these stakeholders. Yeah, it contains all the objects, the IT systems, and so on. So all this we refer as the system context. Yeah, we're going to go details further later. Eh? Don't worry. Okay, so you can actually mention, for example, in our case, the input to the RE process include the stakeholder needs, the existing system itself, yeah, whether it's uh, systems, the software systems, or in the manual systems, yeah, whatever it is, is considered the input yeah, to, the, to the RE process. It can be the input. Uh, also include all the business and technical processes. Yeah, we can have organizational processes. We have, for example, before to support the student registration systems, we have the organizational process of student registration. Yeah, student registration can be considered one of the important yeah, University of Malaya process that need to be supported. Yeah, so that's what we mean. Yeah, there can be others as well. If you develop, for example, the online shop, yeah, one of the business process is Payment, yeah. That means you have to pay for the, the things that you buy. So that is also one important business process, yeah. So depending on where you want to develop the systems, yeah. All right. So also include in the input is the events. Any events, yeah. You can have a registration, I mean registration event, yeah. The date in which the student can start registration, registering their their courses. So that is an event, yeah. The closing date the due date of the exams and so on. So these are all the events that we need to keep track as well, as can be the input to our RE process. And then we also have documents, you know, all sort of documents, registration document, law documents, or maybe, you know, all, uh, maybe the, some of the organization have the standards, you know, that we have to follow. So this can be in, in the form of documents. So this, if they are relevant to our system, this can be good input, yeah? And then we, we want the output, the SRS, the agreement, in the agreement. Uh, that means we have reached the consensus, hopefully after identifying all the requirements from our stakeholders, all this, this thing that we uh, we develop uh, SRS, and we have the agreement of most of our stakeholders. Yeah, So that's also very important output yeah, from our RE process. And then of course, there can be a lot of system models that we develop, a set of models, yeah, such as data flow models or object model, you can have use case model, all this yeah, to support, yeah, to, to clarify yeah, uh, the, the I mean the requirements that we that we have specified in our SRS. All right. So that's what we mean by system models. All right. So having said that, we we how do you perceive RE process requirements engineering process? You might imagine that RE process is a in knowledge intensive process in which they are quite static, maybe, yeah, that you say it's going to be similar, yeah. But actually, what happened is that uh, in in the real environment, yeah, in the industries, you know, in the in the practice, eh, uh, as a whole, uh, RE process is varies, yeah, varies actually. Yeah, I mean, differs yeah from one organization to another. Yeah, it differs as well uh, because there are a lot of factors that can contribute to the differences yeah if you get notice here at least they mentioned here at least four factors that can contribute to the variability of the re process that means you might involve in project a 
that try to perform or try to develop student registration system. They might use, they might have different input. They, the domain is educational domain. So they might use different RE process compared to another project B in which they develop, for example, the ticketing system. Yeah, for the bus for the bus ticketing system uh, in the domain of transportation, and their inputs are different. Yeah, so that means the RE process model or the process that you follow in project A will definitely be different when you develop system B. Yeah, so that's what it means. Yeah? It cannot be the RE process cannot be just the same. Yeah, it's, it's impossible most of the time. Yeah, why? Because of these factors. Yeah, first might be because of technical maturity itself and the technology use. You know, uh, maybe the people that involved in the project A are mostly have a lot of experience, like more than ten years experience. Yeah, compared to project B, in which you know they just have a new, they are just starters, maybe just one or two years experience. Yeah, so because of the experiences, also we influence the way that they perform our e process. All right. Also similar, the second factors that may also contribute to the uh, variability of the re process include the disciplinary involvement. How involved are they? Yeah, you know, I mean, how many? I mean, what what are the discipline? What are the department that involved in the projects? Yes, yeah? so that can also be a difference. It yeah? can also give uh, the differences, can influence the differences of the RE process. Yeah? Similarly, the third factor is the organizational culture. Yeah? You can see that each organization may have different culture, working culture, yeah? a communication culture. You know, in University of Malaya, we have, uh, we have been using, for, for example, our communication culture is more towards email. Yeah, and you can have another university, so another industry, for example, or another software house that may be communicating more on using the telephone. Yeah, so the culture is different. Yeah, so the way that they communicate, the way that they work, yeah, that's what we refer as organizing culture can definitely, yeah, actually influence the way the RE process model can be carried out or the RE process yeah, is being carried out. Yeah. Another one, of course, the application domain. Yeah. So, of course, when we develop a system uh, for the educational domain, sometimes it will, of course, will be different when we want to develop a system for the banking mod, banking domain or for the health domain. Yeah. Or we can have transportation domain just now. So, all these require a little bit different. Yeah. There's some kind of adaptability yeah, to the existing process model that we that we might have come across or you might have learned. Yeah. So, this give us. In other words, you have to visualize in yourself that RE process model or RE process that you're going to perform will vary yeah, accordingly, yeah, according to the factors of technical maturity, to the factors of disciplinary involvement, to the organization culture that you get involved to, or the application domain yeah, of the system that you want to develop. Yeah. All right, so this is the, the thing that we want to mention to, mention, to emphasize. And then we also mentioned that, of course, how do you want to visualize uh, uh, what we call the RE process? Yeah, um, and maybe you want to try to look from the angle of waterfall model. Yeah, how RE process been uh, performing? Yeah, uh, using a waterfall model. Yeah, in waterfall model, you have learned this, I'm sure, in the one of the course, right? Yeah, in which we said that uh, when we develop a software systems, most of the phases, most of the activities are in se sequential sequential meaning that you go to the first phase uh, it's about requ system requirements engineering after you finish these activities you go to the next one so a requirements engineering process you perform all this and then you finish this one you have the, all the output then this we go to the next phase so that's sequential so in this case if you look at it that means uh, one of the phases yeah within the waterfall model will be the requirements engineering yeah all right, so requirements engineering has been done and it will be performed uh, particularly in that one phase and later on they will perform other phases. OK, so you can see, yeah, for example, this is one of the options. Yeah, you can uh, perceive how the RE uh, requirements engineering process been performed yeah, within the software development process as a whole. Or you can visualize like this is quite similar, eh? this is the explanation. You can uh, visualize as the when they use the RAD, 
rapid application development. Yeah, in this case, uh, if in this model, you can see that uh, what happened is that you know uh, for our, for the requirements in the process, they start with the actions of trying to understand the problem, and then they will establish the online requirements, and then they will select the prototyping. So their major tools that they use for RAD is the prototyping. Yeah, that means they will develop some kind of a. Uh, mock systems yeah or it can be just on the you know uh, paper and pencil yeah? to actually clarify what the users want and then based on that they will get feedbacks in order to improve on the requirements yeah so and then after that they will develop the prototype and then evaluate the prototype so they can be like they they mentioned the prototyping just a throw away prototyping just to get the feedbacks or sometimes when they develop the prototype they can be like the evolutionary yeah the prototype will be evolved yeah they improve on the prototypes until it become the real systems yeah so that is what happened in rad yeah one of the you know uh, one of the methodology yes, for the soil development process. So you can see the main element that they use is the, but still that they're actually getting all the requirements from the user and try to improve on that. Yeah. And then there can be another model uh, in which you can, you have, I'm sure you have, most of you have gone through this as well, what they refer as the spiral model, yeah, in which the requirements being actually done iteratively yeah you go iteratively until you're satisfied with the requirements yeah so they might start with the here starting yeah they have a elicitation they try to get requirements from the users and then they try to analyze that they can may start with one or two uh, main uh, requirements from the users and then they try to do the analysis then they negotiate whether most of the stakeholders agree with that and then after that they document those requirements and then they validate yeah they ask whether this uh, that's what the users want that what that's what refers to the commerce validation and then after that yeah they go again in the spiral yeah because after that they just now maybe they just have a set of two requirements now they increase they have two more yeah so now they have four so they go again yeah looking at the elicitation going through the analysis negotiation going through the documentation going through the validation and then they elicit more so that means they are iteratively as well as incremental meaning that you know you are going to get from two requirements to four requirements from six requirements and so on yeah so that's also is a possible model yeah to represent how requirements can be performed so far so good okay yeah all right so all right so in this case yeah you can look at the three models that we have presented to you but what we're going to look at throughout this uh, semester hopefully is we're going to adopt this model which we think is quite comprehensive yeah uh, compact because it's going to detail out each of the activities yeah, that is happening so that we can understand better about requirements engineering process and hopefully we can perform those yeah, to the projects that you want to develop. Yeah? So we're going to refer to the model that being presented by this professor from Germany, yeah? uh, Klaus Paul. Yeah? The model has been there since 2010, yeah? but of course they have you know, enhanced it and so on. So that is what refers to requirements engineering process model. Uh, according to the author, he presented the RE process to contain at least you know, these three core activities. Yeah, elicitation, documentation, negotiation, yeah, and then there are two sites uh, they call cross-sectional activities, which is so important. That means these two are going on here, yeah? the validation process, the sorry, the validation activities as well as the management activities of the requirements, yeah. So basically, there are five main activities, yeah. Three are, are, are referred as the core activities, yeah, the elicitation, documentation, and negotiation. The other two are also important. They call it cross-sectional activities, which is the validations and the management. All these actually are happening in the system context. Yeah, uh, the you mean the context in which the system is developed and operating. Yeah, that's what we refer to system context. You're going to have a more definition about system context later on, but system context also provide all the influences, all the sources of requirements. Yeah, uh, to the development of the system, and we're going to produce what we refer to as the requirements artifacts. Yeah, so this is like a the the human made things. Yeah requirements artifact artifacts yeah that means that the things that have been created by soil developers you know or requirements engineers yeah, to be able to support as an output from the 
uh, process of RE. Yeah? So this includes goals. Yeah, these are the, the the three main things. Yeah, of course there are others as well, but they are referring to the these main three uh, categories of requirements artifacts, which include the goals, the scenarios, and the solution oriented requirements. All right. So of course, yeah, when we refer, we want to focus on this RE process model. Yeah, the, I mean this model defined the major structural elements yeah, of the requirements engineering process for establishing the vision. Still, yeah, we have to have a vision where we want to develop a system. A vision is uh, defined as some of the changes that you want to bring yeah, uh, through the systems. Yeah, and then you want to develop based on the problem statements elicited from industrial practice and which have been successfully validated. So the model actually, yeah, has been. Uh, this is what they, he mentioned. Yeah, this uh, requirements engineering process model actually is been developed. Yeah, based on the industrial practice. Yeah, because based on his experience that he applied in the industries and so on. So he perceived that these are the five core activities that we need to know in order to perform a very proper, suitable, relevant uh, requirements engineering process. OK, and then uh, this model as well has become the reference yeah, to train managers, RE, requirements engineers, the developers to analyze the strength and weaknesses of their RE process model. Okay. So according to this model, these are a few elements that we need later on. We're going to discuss further, but at least the the, man, the the one that I mentioned to you, system contact contains the requirement sources and will strongly influences the definition of the systems. Yeah, and this elicitation, documentation, and negotiation are performed iteratively. So even though yeah, we said that these are the three activities yeah, the three core activities these are not actually sequential yeah uh, what's happening in the world in the real world industrial world in the business world these three activities are happening iteratively yeah because there is no such such thing as sequential yeah sometimes we refer we get the requirements we elicit a requirement which is quite vague here yeah? we try to actually analyze those requirements and then we come back to the stakeholders to verify that to clarify that to validate as well and then after that we go and document them after that you come back to the you know to the uh, people to negotiate whether they accept or not these uh, requirements, you know. So all these activities, you know, validations, management as well, are actually the the process of iterative iterations. Yeah, they are going through, you know, either way, yeah? so that we are able at the end going to refine our requirements. You get a very clear requirement that can be the basis for our system that you want to develop. Okay. All right. So in other words, yeah. Uh, I mentioned to you the, you know, the iteration and so on. So what is the objective? Yeah, in our case, uh, what is the objective of requirements engineering? Yeah, so th these are the three dimensions we want to improve yeah, until we get very clear to be able to produce a very viable, uh, relevant SRS. Yeah, so these are the three uh, dimension. Yeah, in other, in other words, yeah, being put by the by the professor of Paul. Yeah, the first objective is that we want to identify all the relevant requirements. Yeah, which are explicitly known and understood at the required level of detail. So this dimension, yeah, the, fir the first dimension which is very important for us to achieve this goal is to increase the content dimension. It means that we're going to identify all the relevant requirements, which sometimes at the beginning of the projects, you're not sure you get the vague requirements yeah so these need to be you know iteratively understood iteratively elicited uh, i mean iteratively analyzed yeah, until you go going towards a very clear or complete requirement specification so the, the dimension of content in other words another objective as well is the second one you want to have a sufficient agreement about the system requirements is achieved between the stakeholders involved we want because we can be i mean there can be a lot of stakeholders with varying opinions varying various views yeah so they might this one may say that i want this requirement a another stakeholder may say i have a requirement b which is conflicting sometimes which is sometimes complementary yeah but all these they need to be to be agreed upon to be able to come up with a document or re a documented requirements which can be accepted and agreed by the stakeholders involved yeah so that is our objective yeah the second dimension we want to have a sufficient sorry we want to have a sufficient agreement about the system requirements yeah it's actually 
between the stakeholders involved. Yeah, so that is the second dimension yeah, that we want to achieve. Then the third one is this dimension, the documentation. All requirements are documented and specified in compliance with the relevant documentation. Yeah, so besides having to understand the requirement, get the agreement about it, so we have to document them as well. Yeah, so of course, we know, you know, um, most of you know that, yeah, all the developers are busy people, and but I mean, those uh, people that I mean, the teams, yeah, can vary sometimes, you know, people can come out and all. So, the best thing to do is to document them properly, formally, in a good format, so that it can be understood not just by the team members, but can also be submitted to the other teams to be developed. Yeah? So in this case, this is the main, the, the objective as well. Yeah? Sometimes when you go and elicit the requirements, you just bring out the notepad or maybe your recording and then you just draft and sketch your requirements. But that's not enough because our goal is to be able to document them in a proper way, yeah? in acceptable way, in the correct format that is acceptable to the organization. Yeah? So in that case, we are going to this dimension as well to ensure at the end of the day, we're going to have a proper, good, relevant documentation of the requirements that we have agreed upon. All right. So the three yeah, dimensions that we try to achieve yeah, in order to perform I mean, in the process of performing requirements engineering. All right. OK, so we, we mentioned about that three. Yeah, that three elicitation will be discussed yeah, by, by itself yeah, in the in the next lecture. Yeah, but at least we know what is requirements elicitation. Eli, uh, requirements elicitation is to improve the understanding of the requirements yeah, in order to achieve progress in the content dimension. Of course, this cannot be done alone. Most of the time, it should be done collaboratively, yeah? together with the commerce engineer, the developers, as well as the stakeholders, the users yeah? need to collaborate yeah? to, in order for us to get the requirement, to get the proper or elicit the proper relevant requirements. Yeah? And this also, uh, maybe, you know, in most cases, uh, if the system is big, sometimes we'll be able to have so many requirements, but those requirements may not be relevant. So we have to filter them. Yeah? We have to assess them, whether, whether they are really relevant to achieve the vision that has been specified or the objective that has been identified for the system. All right. And then we have documentation here, yeah? the second core activities. This to specify the elicited requirements according to the defined documentation and specification rules. And also sometimes, you know, uh, it's not just good enough to just document what the requirement is. Because sometimes when they go further, then we have to prioritize eh? because it can be a lot of requirements and you don't have enough budget. So what you need to do is to prioritize which requirements should go first. Yeah. So we have to select the most important requirements. Yeah. And if we have we are able to document yeah, some of the rationale why this requirement is important, that will also uh, be very good, yeah. So for the decision making later on, as well as for other reasons, lah, yeah, for traceability and so on. So another important point for the specification beside the requirement is also to re uh, is recommended to document the rationale for selecting those requirements, yeah. And then of course they can be in the organization. They have to set a specific rules on the documentation. Yeah, they can be you know what kind of things that they want. If this usually, I mean, based on the practice, if the organization is small, usually what they do is they will just use existing word documents. You know, all these uh, what we call uh, document-based uh, systems. Yeah, to to keep track of their. Uh, requirements, but if the system is big and then there's a lot of people involved and there can be a lot of changes, they have to uh, most of the time can have to develop, uh, I mean, or purchase, yeah, requirements management system by itself, yeah, to keep track of all the requirements, yeah, because of the changes that can be made and so on, yeah. And in between, sometimes if the organization is quite small, what they use also, there is possible for them to use the Excel, the spreadsheets, and so on, yeah, to keep track of the set of requirements that they have, okay. And of course, the rule has to be set, yeah, so that everybody follows uh, of what kind of a uh, format to be used, yeah, for their document uh, development. All right, the third core activities, which is so important, is the requirements negotiation, yeah. So the goal of negotiating activities is to detect all conflicts as well, yeah, between viewpoints of the different stakeholders, as well as to resolve the conflict using appropriate negotiation techniques. Yeah, it's not easy actually when we deal we. 
if we deal uh, with people, yeah, sometimes it's also some kind of politics, you know, and then we have to make sure that, you know, if there is a, this, a, this, uh, there is a conflict that exists, yeah, between these people we have to resolve, yeah, because remember we said earlier on in the previous chapter that requirements engineer should act as a bridge, right? So we're bridging, yeah, from the technical, from the, I mean, from the people, organizational people to the technical uh, things that you want to develop, which is the software system. So we have to deal, yeah, if especially when we have to develop uh, the requirements document, we have to deal with all this negotiation, yeah, with the stakeholders, because they might have a lot of views, yeah. It's not just about technical things that you develop, it's also about dealing with people, okay? All right. Another cross, uh, two cross-sectional activities which also can influence the requirements engineering process model or also important yeah, inside the RE process model itself is what we refer as the requirements validation uh, activities. Yeah, includes, you know, try to validate, try to, you know, you sometimes you will receive uh, the requirements, you hear these requirements from the users and then you try to write them in a proper way and then you have to ask them back yeah, to check whether this is what they meant because there can be a lot of miscommunication that can occur as well. You might hear something else, yeah. Uh, what, what they have said maybe is distorted with your own thinking, yeah. So that's why validation is always important, yeah. Even in the meeting, after the meetings, you might write down all the detailed summaries of what you have gained from the meetings and then you can have a validation with the users, with the participants, so that this is what important that has been discussed in these meetings or in the workshops and so on yeah so validation can be made yeah it's not just one yeah but can be in several yeah you try to validate the meeting minutes sometimes you can try to validate the the element the artifacts that you have developed yeah the goals that you have actually jot down yeah about the uh, the, the process the scenarios that you have jot down from the users need to be validated back to the users yeah or to the stakeholders and of course the third uh, sorry this one the requirements management uh, activities, yeah, is actually considered one of the most important as well. Yeah, because you can imagine, yeah, if we have a system with like uh, more than 100 set of requirements statements, yeah, and then you, you, there's a lot of artifacts that have been developed, you know, there can be changes being made by team A, team B, yeah, uh, by, this, uh, by the people involved as well. So how could you manage all this, yeah? So you, you have a proper way, you have to know we manage here yeah, for the requirements projects and then how are you going to manage them what are the key things yeah to look after where you want to actually uh, do the management of the requirements yeah Incl include as well if there is any changes to the system context maybe there can be changes to the stakeholders there can be you know a lot of uh, you know organizational change as well that you might want to observe yeah that can give influence to the system that you want to develop all right Okay, so we mentioned earlier about these three kinds of important requirements artifacts, yeah, which include the goals, the vision, the objective, yeah, as the scenarios, set of actions, yeah, uh, the setting, yeah. Sometimes uh, you talk to the users, they will be talking to you how they perform this process. If I talk to you as a student, you can talk, to, uh, I mean, how to register for a course, you might give me a scenario, okay, when I come to the, to this screen, what I need to do, I have to actually select the course and then I have to, you know, uh, make sure that I, I have enough uh, credits, you know. So after that, I will, uh, you know, apply for the course. So that is the thing, so the actions taken, yeah, uh, in the particular scenario, in the particular case yeah, or setting, yeah, they actually can actually perform certain tasks for the users, yeah. So scenarios is important because scenarios is like concrete action, yeah, that you actually need to fulfill yeah, for the task. Yeah? So the, you need to understand the scenarios and later, later on, of course, you have to generalize that to be, become the use cases, right? And later on, generalize further to become the features, the user features, yeah? So that, that means you start, sometimes you can start from the, that's why they said yeah, the requirements engineering process can be top down or it can be bottom up, yeah? You can have a hybrid of that, the combination of that too as well. What, what you mean by top down is that you can meet the stakeholders, ask them what are the goals that you have for the system? What is your objective? Yeah, for example, if you have a student registration system, the goal is to be able to register courses. That's the goal, right? But at the same time, you might not get the clear picture how actually you want to register for the course. So you might go to the concrete 
you go to the portal, you go to the P to the student again, but ask them what exactly how how the registration process can be done, or you can ask the administrator. Yeah, how actually does student registration need to be done? What are the key elements? What are the key actions that need to be taken? Yeah, so that will become the scenarios, right? But these two have to match. Yeah, that means your goal. Yeah, is is important. Yeah, it's important. It's a like it's a, a kind of guidance for you. But at the same time, when you go down, you get the the scenario. But the scenarios can can be helpful as well. But it can be changes sometimes because you want to re-engineer re the process. Maybe last time they you do it manually. Yeah, you have a form and then you just fill up. This is the course I want, and then I go and see the the lecturer to get the signature to allow me to the course. So that is the process. But you look at it. OK, I can actually re-engineer this process to make it more, you know, uh, technology, uh, I mean, more efficient, for example. Yeah, I can actually just ask the student to register to select the course and then the confirmation. Yeah, receive the confirmation from this administrator or from the lecturer, for example. Yeah, so so this is the scenario. So these are the two things. Yeah, I'm not just saying that these two things, but there can be many others. But at least yeah, you can see that this need to be done together yeah this need to be matched yeah? between the objective that you have actually identified from the uh, your stakeholders or your you know your main stakeholders at the same time you might want to also get to the concrete actions that is need to be performed yeah for a certain task in order to achieve those goals yeah this that's what we mean by scenarios and goals and then of course during the process of you know trying to understand this thing uh, try to understand the requirements of the user you might want to identify the data requirements what are the data that need to be to be kept yeah in the database what are the elements that need to be you know transferred confirmation as interactions what are the main functions or so this is the functional perspective if for each student what is the behavior of the student here yeah? They have to do register. They have to confirm the registration. Uh, they have to submit their. So all these are the behavior of the particular objects in the system that you might be needed yeah, to be able to document these things. Yeah. So that is what we refer as the solution oriented requirements. All right. All right. So another element that you need that we have been mentioning as well about the systems that you want to develop is the context. When I talk about context, actually most of the time it's about system context, lah. Yeah, system context. Yeah, the context of the system. Yeah, a short form will be context. Yeah, context actually is the part of the system environment being relevant to understanding the system and its requirements. And of course, yeah, uh, all this yeah changes the boundary implies typically a negotiation with the interface partner because of the external interface adjustment. So you can say that when you develop a system. There is a context around that, yeah. They're going to influence the systems, and you have to create the boundary, yeah. So by actually, actually clarify the scope, yeah. S scope is actually the range of things that can be shaped and designed when develop the system, and changes in the scope don't typically require the consulting of interface partners. All right. So if you look at this, okay. So this is the important diagram, yeah, that you have to understand. Digest this, yeah. So you can imagine if you want to develop a system, yeah. I take a similar system examples like previous one, the student registration system, for example, the course registration system, and then you can see that this is the system, yeah. This one. What what does a system means? A system that you want to develop will contain all the information that you can manipulate. You can make changes to it. Yeah, but the, the things that you bring inside is under your control. So all the objects inside your system is under your control fully that you can make changes to it. Right, OK, and then there can be other objects that can give influence to the system. So if you have a student, I mentioned a student uh, or course registration system, so inside your system will be information objects yeah, about courses. Course, yeah, course itself too, or the student, student information about the student is inside your system. But who gives the influence to that student information? There will be a student objects. The student itself, for example, we have Zamil here, we have Farhan here. So the student itself is a context object outside here in the context. Yeah. 
that can give influence to the information objects inside the system. But can I change the student information inside the system? About Farhan, can I change? If there is a in the system, the information objects of Farhan, I can change. But can I change Farhan outside? I cannot change him. But Farhan is said as a student can give influence to the to the objects that we keep the information about the uh, about, about Farhan inside the system. Yeah. For example, uh, Farhan score very high for his grade from the 3.64, the CGPA increased to 3.75. So information here has been changed. Who give the influence? The object of Farhan from the context objects. You follow? Yeah. So any objects outside here, yeah, even the IT systems, yeah, even uh, you know the uh, what we call the documents that we have analyzed, maybe some laws that influence the system, everything here in the context. Yeah, all these are in the context that can give influence to our system. But we cannot change the system. We cannot change the context, but the context objects, all these things can influence our system. When there are changes to the context, there will be changes to the system objects that we keep inside. But sometimes there can be a, a kind of a gray zone, we said, yeah? because sometimes if our system, for example, at first, May uh, we are not sure whether we want to include the payment system for the fees eh, in our systems or not. Yeah. At first, we said that the payment objects will be inside the systems. So that is here. Lah. But later on, maybe discussion with our administrators and, and so on, they said there's a lot of difficulties, you know, to be able to verify the, all these payment system. And then we say, okay, lah, never, the, the payment will be outside. Yeah. But maybe at first, we put in the gray area first. The payment object, we don't put in the system, but we put KIV first, right? In the gray area, because we are not sure whether to include that payment systems or not to the system. All right, so that is a possibility. All right, so that's the reason we can have a lot of objects. Yeah, but there can also be some objects which is in the gray zone. We are not sure. Yeah, sorry about this. Yeah, but later on, at the end, before the end of the system development, I mean the RE process, hopefully we get clearer ideas. We can have to be, we have to be very clear whether those objects that we are not sure yet, whether to be in the system objects as a system objects or to be the context objects. All right. Similarly, yeah, so this is our context. So what is the definition of context? All the things here should give influence to the system is be able to give influence to the system, all right? But there are cases in which we're not sure. Eh? Sometimes these objects, maybe the law, uh, no, Akta Plaja, yeah? the, the act of the student act, yeah? uh, at first it applicable to the system, yes? Yeah? So we said it's going to be, the act of student act should be under context objects here. But later on we said, no, the, the system not going to handle with the acts. It's not relevant. So the act will be coming out from this. Yeah, it coming out from the one that is going to be relevant to the system will be in the context objects, but the one that does not going to influence the system will be outside the context. All right, but there is possibility like I mentioned to you just now, for example, the student act Yeah, at first we thought that this is going to be influencing the system that we want to develop. It can involve, you know, the, the legality and so on. Yeah, so it will be under context objects, but later on we you know, discuss with all these administrator and they said, you know, no, you shouldn't handle all these things. It's quite difficult for you. So I'm going to take out the objects from the context object to the outside of the context. Boundary, yeah, yeah. So that is also we have what we call as a gray zone, yeah, here. It's a possibility that some objects at first is be considered influential to the systems, but later on we might want to bring it out. Similarly, some of the outside uh, objects yeah, that we think at first is not going to influence our system, but as time goes, we talk to these people and say, this is going to be important as well. So we bring the objects into the context. All right, you get it, okay? So that's what we say that, you know, these are the gray zone, yeah, the not relevant, 
and so on. Yeah. So this is the definition you might mind. I mean, you might want to digest this definition. You know, you have a system, so you have a you have to clear the system boundary. Yeah, separates the plant system of its environment by delimits shapeable, changeable part of the reality from the aspect that cannot be changed through development. Yeah. So it should be system. Everything inside the system is on your power. You can do the changes and so on. Outside that is not your power. Yeah, it's the things that's in the context. Yeah, they're going to influence your objects. Yeah, but it's, you cannot actually change them. All right. Okay. But you also have to identify the system context. All the context that going to influence the system, and the one that is not going to influence the system, we will put outside the context boundary. Yeah, should be outside here. She's not relevant, yeah? So the context boundary here, this is context boundary. Yeah, separates the relevant part of the environment for the plan system from the part, sorry, from the part of the environment which doesn't influence the plan system. So the one outside here, all this were not going to be influential yeah, to the system. But the one system context here going to influence the systems that you're going to develop. Yeah, so it's important for us to recognize this. Yeah, how are you going to represent your system as a context diagram just now? As a context, yeah, you want to represent your system and their context and so on. So you have options. Yeah, uh, you can use what they refer as a con uh, as a context diagram or another word, data flow diagram to represent the context, or you can use the use case diagram. Yeah, because you need to actually be clear. Yeah, what are the main uh, element external entities that need to be to that you need to deal that the system need to deal with yeah so for example you have a ticket sale uh, system uh, for ticketing and then you know that they are going to interact with the external entity of buyer uh, passenger the courier yeah so all these elements there yeah? and these are the information yeah, I'm sorry this is the information that you need to you know input and output to the system yeah the pricing the changes yeah the goals the ticket types and so on yeah so this is the data process the main yeah process yeah, of your system yeah for example this one is ticket ticketing sale yeah sale sales of the tickets yeah you can also yeah so this is uh, some of the uh, key ideas i'm sure you you might have uh, seen this before uh, documenting the system context the context diagrams yeah so this uh, Usually the context diagram will show the external actors lah, that want to interact with the system, what input can this provide, what output they wish to receive. Yeah? And the diagram should include one process. Yeah, It's best that you just focus on one particular system that you want to develop. Yeah, So one process of problem statement and one more endpoints. And you can represent as a context diagram or as a data flow diagram. Or another choice is to use the use case diagram. That one also is quite clear yeah, because it mentioned to you. Sorry, this one. Yeah? Uh, it clearly states so this is the system. Everything here is the, uh, you know, the use cases yeah, that will be provided by the system. Yeah, and this is the external actors. Yeah, the passenger, the carrier. Yeah, that is going to interact with the systems. Yeah, so these are the main, maybe some of the sub processes that will be performed. Yeah, by the system. Yeah, by tickets, define pricing, calculate statistics, get the earnings, and so on. So clearly, yeah. This one mentioned the system and the context, yeah. And you can also have something like this. So this is contact diagrams as well, yeah. Mentioning the booking room system. So these are the external entities of gas, external reservation system. Maybe they have another system that they need to uh, deal, yeah. It's the external reservation systems. They also have to have a rooms, yeah. The, the rooms are external entities as well. And maybe some conceptual objects like the time, the schedule, and the bank external entities, yeah. And the booking itself, yeah, can be considered, yeah, as uh, in the database, yeah. So that means uh, that is also external entities, yeah. The sink, yeah, the, the 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 data where the data has been kept, yeah. Okay, so some information about the context diagram, yeah, that might be helpful to you where you want to draw to represent your system context. Yeah, you can use context diagram because it represents all the external components that may interact, yeah, with the systems. Yeah, hence display the entire software system at the higher level. Yeah, at the higher level. Uh, this can be give us the understanding first before we go to details. Yeah? 
about what are the functionalities, what are the features, what are the users and so on. Yeah? So at least yeah, the system context will separate yeah, between what you want to focus on. What are the system contexts? What are the system? What are the system context? Yeah? What are the external entities yeah, that is involved? So another example is about the ATM systems. Yeah, you can familiar with these ATM systems, but you might be using it every day. Yeah. And you 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 can also actually represent this way. Yeah, the interaction, the sequence diagrams. Yeah. Okay, so it's good or it's very important to document the system content using use case diagram as well because it can show the external actors that want to interact with the system through which use cases they want to interact with the system and the diagram can include one or more actors, one system boundary, the use cases which the system has to support and the relationship between the actors and the use cases. Yeah. All right, so actually that is basic uh, element that I have touched for this one. You want, want to read the books. Most of you have downloaded the books, Requirements Engineering Fundamental. Yeah. So that what this one mostly on chapter two we're discussing about, but we have some other reference as well. So besides the system context that we have discussing, you also refer to the uh, you know the elements of the, the five main activities, yeah, of the uh, requirements engineering process. Yeah. So hopefully you might have the time to read the the chapters okay this is our schedule for the coming i'm sure you know uh, you can see that we have covered chapter two yeah on this projects and then there can be uh, things quite detailed here all right some uh you know we have looked at the definitions the requirements engineers analysis what are the characteristics of them and then we have talked about yeah today about the requirements engineering process yeah the process models processes yeah and then we talk about the models that it can be waterfall sequential iterative and maybe agile yeah maybe rad just now that we have look, look at yeah and then we're going to look at the elicitation next week yeah the basic about elicitation and the techniques, yeah, and then the documentations, and then the management and the validation as well as the negotiation. All right. Okay. Maybe you want to listen to this one. Hopefully, I can't. This one. All right. Let's stop first. I try to share this one. Hopefully, it can come out. Can you see these uh, videos? Yes, but do. Yes, eh? All right. To develop software is to build the machine simply by describing it. People and places touched by the machine. I don't have to see the video. Can you hear? No, we can't see the video. Sorry? You can see the video. You cannot hear, you cannot see the video? Yes. Yes. Can you see the video? No. 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 Can you see now? Yes. 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 You can see now, eh? But we can't hear the video. Hello? Can you see the, the video now? Yes, we can see, but we cannot hear. Cannot hear. Cannot hear, doctor.
Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, may not be, the sound may not be so good. All right, so any questions uh, besides that? The lectures, maybe you want to ask? Uh, doctor. Yeah? Uh, for the group project, uh, can a uh, meet uh, four members of the group must be in meet tutorial group or not? Yes, I would recommend the same group because it's much easier for me to manage. At the same time, if you have questions, you can ask through the tutorial group discussion. Meet to, so can be in tutorial one and two, meet? Yeah, because I'm going to handle the tutorial one separately, right? From tutorial, I mean, the group one separately from the group two. So during the group one, if you have the, uh, questions about your projects, you can ask me as well. Yeah, you can discuss and so on. Yeah, during the tutorial session. So if everyone is inside the group, that will be much easier. Lah. Right. Yeah, so that is the practice. Lah. Usually you are recommended to select your group members from the same group. From the same tutorial group, right, doctor? Yes, from the same tutorial group. Yes. Yeah. Can you? Any questions? Any? Doctor, you want to? Doctor, but if we have already some group by mixing between TG1 and TG2, is that OK? Or we have to reform the group? Uh, who is this Wong? Eh? Uh, Kisho. Oh, Kisho. So, uh, OK, you, you keep on asking the same questions. So what is the problem, Kisho? Uh, I mean, if we have already formed the groups by mixing between TG1 and TG2, we have to reform the groups so we can proceed. How, how many of you? Five? Six? Yes, five. In different groups? Yes. Oh. I would I, prefer in the same group so that I can manage better lah, yeah, for my management uh, sequence as well. Uh, you know, yeah, I think I, yeah, because I allow you to form your own groups, yes, yeah? and then I, uh, but because later on, I, I'm, I hope that I won't miss any of the marks from your groups or whatever, lah, because if you are in different groups, so there's a tendency that I can misplace the marks and so on from one group to another. Hopefully, I don't do that, yeah, but if you, it's, it's a tendency, uh, you know, because there's a lot of you, more than 90, I will be looking in the same group from, I mean, I will be looking most of you in one project groups will be in the same tutorial group. So for much easier for me to give marks and so on. Yeah. If not, then they will have to go to the another sites and all. All these things I might miss your, your, your marks. So I'm sorry if I did that. Yeah, I just have to mention to you earlier. All right. So that's the reason the management issues, the discussion issues and so on. All right, Kishan. You take your own race lah, if you want to do that. Okay. All right. Any other things? So you can actually, we're going to just discuss about the tutorial. That's going to help us a lot, yeah, especially when you have a quizzes later on. So we're going to discuss about your your tutorial one yeah, to, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, 12 to 1 and 1 to 2. At the same time, uh, you might want to register for the projects. You can ask me questions about your projects as well uh, tomorrow. Uh, because the first projects that we intend to do yeah, that are assigned to you is to actually identify existing systems. Yeah? You're going to re-engineer the requirements, meaning that the systems are there. You're going to analyze, investigate yeah, examples, and then you're going to extract the main target goals that you think is appropriate for the system. So who are the main users? Uh, what are the requirements that they offer? Yeah? So you're going to re-engineer those requirements coming from the existing systems. And I hope that most of the groups won't select the same. I don't want to have the same uh, system yeah, to be selected by projects. I mean, I don't want to, you know, for example, you select PowerPoint system. Yeah, PowerPoint is one of the so systems that might be very interesting to you, but I don't want to have any other groups that select the same thing. So that's why you have to register at the, uh, you know, at the, 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 I mean, the, the, the wiki yeah, that I already uh, put up at the spectrum. All right. Adding anything? Islan, Akmal, any questions beside that one? Clear? 
All right, so we can discuss that after discussion of our questions in tutorial. At the same time, you can ask me whether the system that you have selected is appropriate or not, yeah, to be implemented as your project one, yeah, tomorrow. Okay. Yes. Can you give a comment? Yes, at the chat. Oh no. Yeah. Yes or no? That's me. No question? You want the, to play Yahoo with me? Kahoot with me? Anyone? No. Hafiz, what do you think? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I know maybe some of you might already exhausted. Okay, never mind. Yeah, uh, we, uh, you know, we uh, hopefully we can, you know, play in after week three or week four eh, later on. Yeah, so hopefully you manage to digest what I already presented to you for this chapter two. I know most of you might have some difficulties try to understand these materials, but please do readings. Yeah, there's a lot of books available as well. You can search. There's the one that I give to you. I share to you. That's also very, very short and sweet, actually highly recommended for you to understand the material yeah okay so hopefully you can yeah you can try to read those things yeah okay um, Yongli, you asking about the tutorial questions yeah already uh, i already shared with you yeah that means you can try you can collaborate yeah the, the document that i share with you i share to you the the the, the document right you can do you try to answer yeah most of you can actually give answers to that one can you collaborate the, the same document? So I will discuss based on your answers that you have given to the document, yeah, tutorial one that I already uploaded at, the, at this spectrum. Yeah, I already uploaded the tutorial questions at the spectrum. Uh, there will be tutorial one for group one, tutorial one for group two. So all the group members can collaborate, can look at the questions, you can you know, if you think that your answer is correct, you just put in. Yeah, it can be several. Yeah, it can be come from uh, one from Nuru Shakina. It can come another answer from Lim Wong Kong. Never mind. You collaborate so that I can see and discuss with you tomorrow. You got it? Uh, yeah, so that is your collaborative work Yeah, to answer the tutorial and then we discuss Yeah. Tomorrow, OK? All right. All right, then. Uh, uh, OK, so I think that's all yeah, for this uh, class. Yeah, hopefully we see you tomorrow. Most of you. Yeah, please. Uh, similar, you have to scan through your attendance. Yeah, uh, using the QR code that I'm going to upload at the spectrum. Yeah, just uh, for the attendance for the tutorial as well. All right. Have you a good the... day. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Please, the one that record for me, the uh, this one. Can you upload that? Share with us eh, the file, recorded file at the. What happened? Oh, Sorry. okay, okay, <laughs> okay. You post to that one. All right. Thank you, then, everyone. Have a good day. Bye bye. See you next week. Uh, see thank you tomorrow you. for the tutorial. Bye bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Uh, All right. See you. Assalamualaikum. Bye bye.